You may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. Attorney Ann M. Prater appearing on behalf of Defendant Appellant Ernesto Uribe. This case uh, involves interpretation of the, not just the statutory language, but the Watkins case in general. The prosecution uh, obviously would rather have everything read to be <coughs> shall, not may, um, or not, uh, is, or can be. Um, I've read roughly, I think around 200 to 300 cases roughly regarding the Watkins case and the statute in question, and there has not been any instances that I could find where there was ever any incidents where such other acts evidence has ever been included or excluded versus included. Um, nothing in Watkins uh, says that every factor has to be considered um, prior to excluding anything out. Um, the question is, is obviously why have Watkins and why have such a statute and language in the statute um, that gives discretion if such evidence is never going to be excluded at all. Um, I'm going to go straight into what the prosecution's uh, arguments are. Um, obviously nothing says in Watkins that every factor must be considered nor does the statute state that every uh, that such evidence shall be entered. It simply says that such evidence is admissible. Is does not indicate mandatory, shall does. If that was going to be uh, something that is going to be included every single time, say so. Say what you mean, <coughs> do what you say. Why say such evidence may be admissible instead of shall be if there's never going to be an instance where it's not going to come in. <coughs> Regarding the Watkins fact and factor, specifically um, states that the list is not exhausted, indicating that not every factor has to be considered. That's one of the arguments that the prosecutor makes. I think if you look at Watkins, it says that this list is not inclusive, meaning that you don't have to look at all of them. If there's more, you can look at. Um, as far as the uh, dissimilarity factor that um, the prosecution looks at, um, there's nothing in Watkins, there's nothing that states that all of the acts have to be considered. Um, there, there is no totality of the circumstance argument. As far as um, looking at the dissimilarity uh, of the acts, uh, that is fine to do. Um, nothing in the list of factors says that, um, if you look at the language of, the, of that, it says the dissimilarity between the other acts and the charged crime, not look at all the dissimilarity. Um, the prosecution argues the judge must, as with a motion for directed ver verdict, hypothesize how the jury might consider the evidence. That is, give, give its maximum possible probative weight as the jury might, and its minimum prejudicial weight, again, as the jury might. That's basically circular logic. Um, it's not necessarily the strongest argument for them. The, jury, the judge acting as jury it is okay to hypothesize about how the jury might consider the evidence. However, you have to take into consideration that at a jury trial, the jury's given instructions to look at credibility of the witnesses before they consider what weight they're going to give it. I think that's something that has to be looked at in weighing this kind of evidence. We're not looking at um, necessarily evidence that is physical evidence. We're looking at witness testimony here. So kind of comparing apples to oranges, as far as um, not looking at credibility at all, um, if you look into reliability versus credibility, you can't really consider re reliability of this kind of evidence without looking into, into the credibility. Um, as far as making that consideration, I think that's something that's got to be done prior to the um, judge saying yes or no to let it come in or not. Um, as far as uh, language that courts are liberally to admit evidence of prior uncharged sex offenses. It doesn't say shall, it says liberally, meaning there's got to be some sort of exemption somewhere. Um, as far as uh, the statute is concerned, um, Watkins talked about that again. It doesn't mean, however, that other acts evidence admissible under the statute may never be excluded under uh, MRE 4 or 3 as overly prejudicial. One of the arguments that they make is that Judge Cunningham looked at nothing but the prejudicial value. Nothing says she can't. Um, I'm, as far as the analysis that she did, in my opinion, 
she looked at both sides as she should there is still some of that weighing factor in there i think more than anything i think the prosecution's just dissatisfied knowing full well that there's language in there that gives exceptions what specifically is that language if you've read two or three hundred cases as you've suggested you did apart from the drudgery of it all you you're you're pretty clear that there's a straightforward framework there with 403 being the principal limitation upon um evidence being admitted under 768.27a but under 403 what specifically is the problem is it the danger of unfair prejudice confusion of the issues or misleading the jury in some regard what specifically is the problem in 403 I think it's a combination of all of it. Um, we're looking at a situation that is highly inflammatory no matter which way you look at it. It's a horrible, horrible case to have, any kind of criminal sexual conduct case involving a child. I think that as far as... Um, the statute, though, to sort of takes that and out of the equation, right? To an extent. But, well, under 404B, that would be highly relevant. Correct. How, whether, whether these were exactly the same kinds of sexual assaults or, but the statute has been, has essentially said 404B considerations are irrelevant. That's correct. This, this evidence that would be excluded otherwise comes in unless it offends 403. <coughs> so I guess I'm, I'm really interested in your answer to uh, Justice Markman's question, which aspect of 403 can't merely be the fact that it's ugly, because <laughs> everything that's relevant could be prejudicial. Exactly. So I, what is it? How is it unfairly prejudicial or any of the other factors that are, that are listed in 403 offended by this evidence? I think Watkins explains <coughs> that in uh, fairly good detail. No. Here. This is the testimony of the defendant's child that the prosecutor sought to admit, right? Correct. What of, about that testimony is an offense to the standards under 403? I think it's an offense because it's been determined that that testimony is not credible. Who makes credibility determinations? It depends on the situation. Really? Well, in my opinion, like I had mentioned earlier, if you're looking at reliability of a witness. Reli is reliability and credibility, are those two the same concept? They're intertwined, is what I'm trying to argue. So look at, we're talking. Like reliability a, kind of is like, can anybody believe this? Credibility is, is this particular person believable, right? I think in analyzing reliability, though, you have to look at credibility. I think the two are intertwined. I don't think you can, when you're looking at this specific type of evidence, okay, I'm not bringing in, say, I think, a, I think, counsel, I think what the Chief Justice is saying is that the, the trial judge's own assessment of this witness's credibility is at least distracting for us at this point, right? So how, how, could you do a better job than the trial judge did in describing why this evidence was properly excluded given Watkins and 403? What she said. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do my best here. I think I'm, I think I'm understanding the question. Uh, essentially, I, I think in this particular case, it is fact intensive. I mean, unfortunately, we are a Jerry Springer, Judge Judy society, okay? So in this particular case, because you have to look at the relationship to the um, I, you know, I, I understand that I, I, we don't even fault. We understand that trial judges are making these decisions on the fly. They don't have the benefit like we do of getting to like carefully think about how we might say something that would, you know, then not stumble on appeal. But but I, we're giving you a chance for a do-over. <laughs> say say what you think the trial judge should have said, such that we would never have gotten involved in this business, and you know you 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 wouldn't have had to be here today if the trial judge had done a better job instead of saying of I articulating don't find a proper basis for a four or three for, uh, well, exclusion. I think again you have to look at the Watkins case to to figure out if you even get to the four or three B according to what that says. I think she she went through a full analysis. I don't think she missed anything. Stop. Full stop. I believe it's arguable that if the judge says, I don't believe this girl, and, and that's the articulated reason for a 403 uh, exclusion, 
that's error because it doesn't go uh, that's something that uh, the judge doesn't have an opportunity to do that some credibility something we allocate to the jury if however the judge says if, if she said in the course of an alien abduction my dad assaulted me that is testimony that might be considered unreliable because nobody could believe it. Do, do you understand the distinction between, uh, maybe I haven't Correct. articulated it well, but that's the difference between credibility of the witness and the underlying reliability of what the witness is testifying about. Did the trial judge not make the determination, I don't believe this girl? I'm not saying she didn't, but I'm saying she also considered many other factors, some of which didn't get included, I think, into the court record. Well, if the judge's determination was, I don't believe this girl, uh, is, is, is part of the decision, what else was the, did the judge properly consider under 403? I think she looked at, um, I mean, obviously, if you look at 403, there's, there's the different factors. Um, as far as unfair prejudice, Obviously, that's one of them, and just in considering. Well, what, look, I think Watkins said that's off the table, unless it's way out, right? Because the statute favors the admission of this. <coughs> well, if it's going to be that way, then the statute should say, shall come in for every instance, no matter what. Why, why leave the language open to interpretation? Why have Watkins at all? Um, I believe she looked at the unfair prejudice part of okay. it because basically you, she looked at or had to have looked at the, the relationship between the parties, okay? And that's pretty incendiary. You, you've got a much closer relative going on in that situation. Um, as far as confusion of the issues, obviously that's always there. He's going to be on trial for the testifying victim that's not actually what he's accused of. Um, misleading the jury, I mean, obviously, if the, he's done it before, he's going to do it again, and obviously that's what the statute is there for. Um, uh, as far as considerations on due delay, waste of time, needless presentation of cumulative evidence, um, obviously, I think, to be fair, you have to look at both. I think she did go through everything as far as looking at the specific incidences, and I think she acted. Would you she, like to reserve any time for rebuttal? Yes, thank you. Now's the time, though. Good morning, Justices. Brent Morton with the Eaton County Prosecutor's Office on behalf of the people. Uh, in denying the people's request to admit testimonial evidence under MCL 768.27a, Judge Janice Cunningham committed three reversible errors. First, she misapplied the Watkins reliability factor by conducting a credibility assessment of the proposed witnesses. Reliability is a threshold determination of admissibility, not a determination of the ultimate truthfulness of the proposed testimony. Secondly, she misapplied the dissimilarity factor by analyzing the similarity of the sexual acts rather than the total facts and circumstances of the incidents. Under MCL 768.27a, Sufficient similarity is established for admission is established when evidence is, involves a listed offense committed against a child. Any dissimilarity assessment impacts the weight of the evidence probative value and is not inherently prejudicial. And third, she ignored the proper standard review for admission under MRE 403, which is when probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. We would ask that you uh, prepare and issue a, a peremptory order that does three things. First, affirms the Court of Appeal ruling permitting admission of the testimony and prohibiting exclusion based on an MRE 404B analysis. Secondly, we ask that you clarify that the reality fa real excuse me, reliability factor does not permit judges to overstep their authority and act as a jury and conduct a credibility assessment. Basically, reliability does not equal credibility. And third, we ask you to clarify that the dissimilarity factor is not merely an analysis of the sexual act, but instead analysis of all the facts and circumstances surrounding the incident. Sufficient similarity for admission is established when there's a listed offense committed against a child, and any dissimilarity reduces the probative value. I would be happy to answer questions. I have one, I guess. 
Um, so if the defendant in this case had been convicted of the other act evidence we're talking about here of sexually assaulting J.U., um, that conviction would certainly be reliable. I, I, I expect you would agree, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, but here, he wasn't convicted, he wasn't even charged, and the only evidence of, that the assault occurred was her account, which came after an initial denial, and which, therefore, the jury is still going to have to make a determination about whether to credit before it consider it as evidence of whether the defendant is guilty of the current charge, right? The, the jury has to make this sort of intra-trial credibility determination. The jury has to, not, not the judge. Do you, yes, you agree the, with the jury is instructed to determine whether or not the other act happened before right. they even may, may even consider it. And, and do those considerations properly factor into whether evidence is reliable? The fact that the jury has to sort of come to some conclusions about this <coughs> separate evidence um, before it can determine what to do with it in the context of this case. Could you imagine a trial judge saying <coughs> that that set of factors um, can be distracting or confusing to a jury so much because it shifts its focus um, from adjudicating the defendant's guilt of the instant charges to this other charges, um, so much so that I think it's a 403 problem. With that, if the judge had described what I don't even know if it's a he or a she, because I don't know who the trial judge was. It doesn't matter to me. But he or she was thinking that way. Would you say, well, okay, fair enough. That's a proper 403 consideration. Well, I, I'm, I apologize. I don't completely understand the question, because I, it's, it's. The judge is, it, we, the judge is making the 403 contemplates that something that might be probative could be so distracting that it's 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 not admissible because of it's 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 so distracting to the jury. If if the judge had postured her decision more along those lines and making a credibility determination, uh, I could think that's what you're. Yeah, I'm just saying that the judge. I, I I I think that the judge framed this credibility question as you know what the judge thought about credibility, and that's distracting. If the judge had said. This is an uncharged, this is conduct that's not convicted, not charged, and in fact about which there have been conflicting statements from this witness. That's going to distract the jury in a way that's significant enough that I think it poses a 403 problem, which Watkins properly says you're still supposed to and allowed to consider. If the judge had said it that way, would we be here? Well, I, I think that she conducted a credibility as analysis which she's not permitted to do, and partly because the jury needs to, to face that issue because under MCL 750.520H. I think we're trying to figure out if the judge had made a proper, perhaps from your standpoint, erroneous uh, analysis, but proper under 403, I think this is very distracting. I think it's so distracting that it outweighs the uh, probative value, and I'm keeping it out on that basis. That's a different, at least that's the right venue, right? Well, yes, it's an art This judge, it's this judge is outside the, the boundaries of 403 entirely when she says, this, this girl isn't credible. My qu I guess we're trying to figure out if, if the judge is articulating uh, one of the factors that, that's permissible under 403, how do we assess that? If she, I mean, if she I mean, this isn't it, just I mean, about your case. But I understand okay. that. So we're trying to figure and, out how to. I mean, I think there are many cases, if you, def if you, swip, if you swap the, the witnesses in this case in a hypothetical, and you say that the charge defense is the touching, and the other act that we want to bring in is the egregious act of, of the, the years of raping, then I think you could eat, the judge could assess and articulate that this is so egregious it's substantially more prejudicial and probative, and so we're going to keep it out under 403. But in this case, we have a less egregious act that we're trying to bring in as other evidence. So she did not articulate that it was more prejudicial, but substantially she, more prejudicial. Had she done it as, as Justice uh, McCormick <laughs> suggested, I, this, is, this is so dissimilar, so distracting, uh, I'm keeping it out on that basis. Under 403. 
How do we, how do we, how do we, first of all, what's the standard of review for that? Well, I believe it's de novo. Um, I believe that. Do you owe no deference to the trial court's thinking about this question? I, I, I believe that you, you have the ability to review the record and determine whether or not it's appropriate. Um, with regard to, you know, if she'd, if she'd done a 403 analysis, then yes, I think she, she, she could have been successful if she'd articulated that. But if you look at her holding, that's not what she did. She did a propensity analysis. I guess I'd like to ask the corollary question to what I think both my colleagues are asking here. Um, because I think it's important for the next hundred cases in which we're dealing with Watkins, but how is 403's breadth, if at all, limited by 768.27a? In other words, 403 says what it says. It lays out the, the prejudicial analysis in which you're basically engaged in a balancing process. But how is that precise balancing process uh, affected by the introduction of this new statute in 768A.27. In other words, we've been asking how 768.27A is limited by 403. I'd like to know how 403 is limited by 768. Well, in the past, uh, the... Which the, I think is the same question in a different mm -hmm. form than my colleagues are asking. Obviously, 768.27a allows us to use the evidence to show propensity to commit a crime or to commit these sexual acts against minors. In the past, in 403, that came on, that fell on the prejudicial side. Now, propensity falls on the probative side. And so, things that, that I think it's counterintuitive for all judges when they analyze this because they look at 403, they look at this evidence and propensity always falls on that prejudicial side. Now you have to take a step back and put it on the, on the uh, probative side. And I think that's the, the change. That, that's the influence that this statute has on the 403 analysis. Well, but, okay. Now, if we move out of, of propensity and, and the judges are trying to articulate a different basis for excluding under 403, not saying it's propensity. I don't like propensity. We don't let propensity in. That's what this judge said. It's, it's designed to say he did it, he did it. He did this, he did it again. So if we're in a different zone, how does, how do the, the statute in 403 relate if, if the judge is trying to articulate a, a non-propensity basis for excluding under 403, like distraction? I'm sorry, distraction? Yeah. That's one of the bases of, of keeping the issues too distracting for the jury. Well, the judge has to articulate some sort of distraction. I mean, it, it, what Judge Cunningham did, she said, well, the dissimilarity is so great that it's, that it's prejudicial. And dissimilarity goes to the weight of the, credibil the weight of the probative value, and she didn't articulate any prejudice. Okay. And so you would need to articulate that the, because of the dissimilarity, the emotions of the jury is going to be swayed. It's going to be distracting. You need to articulate why that is. Okay. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any rebuttal? I think I finally figured out what was being asked of me. <laughs> Better um, late than never, though. <laughs> better later, better later than never. Um, essentially, the judge did look at uh, distracting factors in the situation. Um, the other acts evidence. Is she did a pretty poor job of articulating that. Then. Well, tell me how, where that that's where I can look to in the record and find. She clearly said this is propensity. That's what you want to put this in. Propensity is clearly off the table after the statute in Watkins, right? Correct. She talked about credibility. Clearly, I think, judges don't do credibility. Correct. So what was the zone of proper decision making here? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What was her zone of de proper decision making here? Essentially, I think what she did, I, and I, I understand she didn't articulate No, I want to well. know what she said. Um, 
I believe she was looking at it as. I want. And I, I can't. I, I can't figure out what she had in her heart or mind. Correct. What did she say that is justified under Watkins in the statute? I'm paraphrasing, I guess, because um, I don't have the transcripts memorized. Okay. Essentially, I believe what the analysis was is in regards to not only just the fact that um, the evidence would be extremely distracting to the jury, I think the other aspect was we are looking at one instance, but the incident <coughs> involves Mr. Reedy's biological child. I think she's looking at that situation as being something that is going to be distracting to the jury. Um, essentially, if that jury has to take a look at both of these incidents, says with the credibility issue, essentially the jury's gonna be having two trials wrapped up into one. She, she evaluated the, what she, her, her sense of the similarity between the two offenses and she found them dissimilar to, <coughs> in a meaningful way. And Watkins says actually that the degree of similarity is relevant to the strength of the propensity inference. So I'm not, so without, so without criticizing her evaluation of that, but rather her conclusion, what, what, what's so different about the two allegations? They're both allegations where the victim is a daughter or daughter figure to this defendant um, that he's taken advantage of in the same kind of relationship. What, why are they so dissimilar? The dissimilarity is, is between an I want to try to figure out how to phrase this properly. The dissimilarity is, is how... Success of the assault? I'm sorry? The specifics and the amount of assaults maybe, but isn't Correct. it extremely similar that, that they're both children he is like a father or a father figure to? Um, In these that, cases, that is often the case. It's usually somebody that the, the victim knows, no matter what. Um, and is usually, it's not something along the how lines does that help where it's you? a stranger. Um, it doesn't, obviously. Um, back to your original question is, she's looking at, I think, the relationship. I think she's looking at the length of time. I think she's looking at how many times the other act's witness has changed her mind, okay, as far as the differences. And I think do the, the different alleged actions. Not only that, but I believe, and I could be incorrect in the saying this, but I know there was a, an abuse and neglect case on this. And this did not come about until a lot of contact with caseworkers and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that had any bearing on it, but there was a lot of waffling back and forth. And different versions, I think, of the events that happened with the other acts evidence. I don't think it was a consistent one. Okay. Thank you very things. much. Case is submitted. Thank you.